Okay, well, we're, we are right at 6.01, so let's get started. First, I would like to uh, welcome the Dean of the Tulane School of Professional Advancement, uh, Dean Suri Daich, who's gonna share some remarks to get us started, and then we will continue with the rest of our program. So Suri, I'll hand it to you. Thanks so much. Um, quick remarks, probably not even worth the, the word remarks. Um, we're so excited to have all of you with us for this um, event this evening and, um, and to have great turnout. So we're excited about that as well on this um, just about to storm evening in New Orleans. Um, I wanna welcome, welcome you to the Tulane School of Professional Advancement and to the panel Funding Equity Black Professionals in Philanthropy, which we're holding in observance of the 10th anniversary of Black Philanthropy Month. And so before I do a short commercial for SOPA, as we call it, I wanna thank my colleagues who are presenting, especially Dr. Leek Francis, who planned and will facilitate the panel and who leads the program in public administration at Tulane. Everyone watching or participating in the panel this evening knows the critical role of Black philanthropy in racial equity and social justice work. And um, I, before I hand things off to her though, I wanna just say a few words about SOPA. Um, so the School of Professional Advancement at Tulane is the current iteration of a longstanding commitment by Tulane to educating working adults and offering applied learning relevant to the workplace. Our bachelor's and master's degrees and our undergraduate and graduate certificate programs are all either in specific industries and fields where there's need for educated professionals or our humanities and social science programs that are specifically structured for working adults. Our programs are split between online and on campus in New Orleans. And we have diversity of all kinds in our school, including um, amongst our faculty and staff and, um, and amongst our student body, where about half of the students in our school are Black, Indigenous, and people of color, or BIPOC. The public administration program, with its explicit focus on racial equity, fits in well at SOPA and reflects our values. And um, for all those reasons and more, I'm so pleased that we're having this panel this evening. So. Thanks for attending. We look forward to the event. We look forward to you getting to know us more if you're not already part of our academic community and us getting to know you more. And um, with that, I'll hand things over to Dr. Leek Francis. Thanks so much for this opportunity. Thanks so much, Suri. Um, and I truly appreciate you joining us today. Um, so, I really, I want to start by, again, expressing my gratitude to all of you who are joining us for this panel today, where we're not only celebrating the 10th anniversary of Black Philanthropy Month, but today's conversation is really intended to give us the chance to explore the far-reaching impact of Black professionals working in the field of philanthropy. Um, before we get started, I want to let you know that the panel is being recorded, so you'll be able to share it with friends, families, colleagues, rewatch it um, if you didn't have the opportunity to do so. And if you have any questions, I want to invite you as we are having our conversation to use the Q&A the function at the bottom of your screen where you can submit questions, and I'll field those um, later on in the, in the discussion. Now, um, along with serving as moderator, I want to thank our panelists and also their organizations who are represented um, here on the upcoming screens or upcoming slides that you'll see in a moment. So here are our panelists who will be joining us for the conversation, and I'm going to go through with their uh, brief bios in a moment, and also their organizations who so kindly are supporting us uh, for this event this evening. So I'm going to start with introducing uh, Dr. Mark Barnes. I'll start with our gentleman first. He's the only gentleman with us today. Uh, Mark Barnes is the Vice President for Institutional Advancement and Ex-Officio Board Member 
for the Center for Racial Justice at Dillard University. Um, some highlights about Mark is that he's been uh, in his role since February of 2013, and he uh, played a key role in leading the SAFE Fund, uh, the student assistance and fi for finance, student assistance for financial emergencies fund, which effectively raised over $2 million, allowing a thousand Dillard students to continue their studies in the face of financial hardship. So Mark, thank you so much for that work. I'd also like to introduce you to Kimberly O'Neill, who's a founding member of the Heritage Giving Fund and also faculty for the Tulane SOPA Public Administration Program. Um, the Heritage Giving Fund is a Black women's giving circle that invests in Black women-led nonprofit organizations that serve Black women and girls throughout the state of Texas. So as you can see, that work is tremendous and has helped many, many organizations to uh, advance their missions and do effective work in the area. Along with being a founding member of Heritage, uh, Kimberly is also a faculty member, as I shared, and the founder of Cause Studio, which is an initiative that provides training resources to aid in the capacity building efforts of nonprofit organizations. Thank you for joining us, Kimberly. And next we have uh, Christy Wallace Slater, who's a program officer for the Kellogg Foundation. Uh, in this role, she helps to develop programming priorities, reviews, and recommends proposals for funding. Uh, she also manages and monitors a portfolio of active grants and designs and implements national grants initiatives, place-based place work, and multi-year projects that affect systemic change and program strategy in New Orleans. So Christy, thank you for the work that you've done in supporting New Orleans and the work that you've done with Kellogg. So without further ado, I will jump right on in. And if we can go to our panelist screen so we can see everybody's face here and fully engage in the conversation, thanks. Um, so I'll start first with uh, a grounding question for us, honestly. Why is the representation and, and presence of Black philanthropy professionals important, both in fundraising and on the funding side? And we'll start, we'll start with you, Kimberly. I think one of the things um, that we have to factor in is that, you know, the Black community has always been philanthropic. Our way of giving just has looked very differently. Um, Valeda Fullwood said in Giving Back when she shared what for Black philanthropy looked like, she often talked about for us, it looked like braiding hair on the steps. It looked like giving food to your neighbors. We have always been in that mode. But what has truly happened over the course of years is philanthropy has started to look just wealthy. And when we started to look at it from that lens, it meant that the Black community historically has then been pushed out. But we are the group that has been the most giving in terms of what's coming out of our households and what's being given into the community we give more from our households, regardless of wealth, regardless of income, than any other group. And so for us, it is important for us to not just say we give back, we're doing good in the community. It is important for our community to utilize the language of philanthropy, to identify as philanthropists, for us to describe what philanthropy means to our community, to ensure that the relevant pieces to our culture are included in the conversation. And I often say that when we're talking about philanthropy, a lot of times when it comes to doing good for the Black community, it is often meant assimilation. It is meant that someone is stripping away some of the cultural aspects of what's important to us to ensure that we fit a certain mold. So it's important that the Black community and whatever ways that we choose to be philanthropic that fits within the landscape of what works for our homes and our individual pockets for us to be able to, to protect and share the cultural narrative because it's important to our, for our survival as a community, but to also champion the way that we've been able to do good um, and support everyone else, um, including just our neighbor next door and what that means. So I'll start off with that way and I'll kind of leave the rest of the time for everyone else and I'll pick back up if there's time. Thanks so much. Mark, would you like to take a, a stab at that question as well? You're on mute. 
you're still on mute. It's not a, on, there we are. There you go. I'll, I'll start off with talking about how I got into uh, this business. How did I get into fundraising? Because I, I was working at a bank and you know my, my career was set as far as I was concerned in terms of what I was gonna do with the rest of my life. Uh, and somebody started introducing this idea of fundraising to me uh, and going over to Dillard, Dillard University to do this work. Uh, and, I, and I resisted it uh, because I didn't understand what it was. Uh, this was just over 20 years ago. At that time, the Kresge Foundation uh, uh, had made a decision to invest in several HBCUs uh, to help them build their fundraising capacities. What Kresge realized uh, at that time was uh, HBCUs had been traditionally underfunded, both in terms of philanthropy, as well as for state institutions, state funding. Uh, so they decided to invest in a number of HBCUs to help them build their capacity to do fundraising. What they understood uh, then, and what we have to understand now, is representation for our organizations, in our organizations, by our people, uh, is very important in terms of who's advocating for our institutions. Uh, and so I came in under that initiative uh, that was started by the Kresge Foundation, and they provided a, a lot of training in, in helping me understand what this business was about and how do I properly advocate for this HBCU. So I want to talk about what, what philanthropy is. Philanthropy is really a, a vehicle through which uh, organizations are supported initiatives, programs, and schools uh, are supported to carry out their missions to make society and the world better. Philanthropy supports the work in the community that serve the people. The people represent a wide, uh, wide array of demographics, perspectives, ideas, needs. Without the presence of Black philanthropy professionals on the fundraising side of the business, Organizations that support Black people would not have advocates who understand what they need. Without the presence of Black professionals on the funding side, many, many major funders would not be aware of the needs of the people in the Black community. So having Black people in those spaces bring Black people into conversations about who and what kind of initiatives those major, major funders will support. So, from my view, representation in this profession is really critical to get Black people the resources they need to get Black people at the table to have the conversations so that uh, we understand, everybody understands these organizations exist for the good of not just Black people, but the benefit of all of society. Uh, so representation is really important and critical so that we can be at the table uh, and in having these conversations about supporting uh, all of these organizations that are benefiting our, our people. Absolutely. You all have me all getting chills now. Um, so Christy, your thoughts. <laughs> wow, I mean, it's gonna be hard to top that, but uh, <laughs> what I would first, good evening, everyone. Um, what I would add uh, to the conversation is, um, the rep representation is important because of the proximity to communities we serve. Um, so, you know, just as Mark was just talking about having a seat at the table, you know, there's a saying, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And so we need folks like us at the table so that we can keep other folks off the menu. Um, and, you know, so what, is, what does that look like? I think it's being able to, um, bring the perspective of the communities that we serve into the rooms where decisions are being made. Uh, and uh, coming from a national funder perspective, we can get into rooms that often the community can't get into. And so, um, sorry, I live like on a drag strip, so y'all gonna hear all kind of fun traffic in the background. Um, but we get into rooms that other folks can't get into. And so, I think you know black folks in philanthropy have the responsibility of being able to navigate from the barroom to the boardroom 
and being able to carry that message from the community into the rooms where decisions are being made about how resources get spent, how um, policies are created, and to be a, a voice for the folks that normally will not have access. So it's it really is about um, you know that 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 proximity to the communities we serve is is very critical um, in making sure that we we keep and and uh, represent at that seat at the table. Halima, can I add one thing yeah, sure. um, to, the, to this that I think it's also important as we talk about representation? Mm -hmm. um, it's also important for us to to own and and to teach our community that it's okay to say philanthropist. And I'm saying that from personal experience, because I remember that I had trepidation about calling myself a philanthropist, that, um, that maybe I wasn't where I needed to be financially when I was younger, you know, to be considered a philanthropist because of what tradition has taught us um, on the global scale of what philanthropy should look like. And so I think, you know, when we talk about representation of Black philanthropy in the community, I think there is a responsibility for those of us that are already within, within the arena to be able to correct people, to educate people, to share with people, to encourage people that you too are a philanthropist and your way of giving does not need to look like everyone else's. It does not need to look like wealth, long-term wealth, historical wealth, giving is giving and how you choose to give back does not does not diminish your ability to use the word philanthropy and i think that that's something if there's anything that we can kind of encourage through this conversation it's it's okay this conversation is not limited to philanthropists or those that are engaging and probably looking at philanthropy if you give in any capacity you are a philanthropist and you are able to define that for yourself. So I just wanted to add that because as we were going through the conversation, I remembered how I struggled as someone that was writing checks. I struggled to be called a philanthropist because I thought I had not earned that title yet. Mark, I saw you come off mute. Um, you look like you wanted to chime in something there, um, perhaps a perspective yeah, I, I was just, your experience. Clear, clearly, what Kimberly was saying was just was just tugging at me because she's 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 so right, and I think we really do have to understand what the what philanthropy is. And if you look at the etymology of of the word philanthropy, right, it 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 means it comes from Latin, the love of mankind. And it has nothing to do with money. Philanthropy is about giving back to others for the love of giving back and helping people. Um, and so, I, you know, really understanding, but even if you look at it from a monetary standpoint, there's, there's data that shows that African-American is the, is the most philanthropic demographic in the United States per income dollar earned. Uh, so, you know, now a lot of that money goes to the church, right? Uh, but Black people give even you know, as a proportion of what they make more than any other demographic in the country. Uh, so we really do have to understand and, and almost in a sense redefine uh, what philanthropy is uh, and kind of reframe it because we really belong at the table. Kimberly, you really belong at the table when we're talking about philanthropists and the work that you do because it is philanthropy. So I just wanted to, you, you were tugging at me on that. So I just wanted to add that in. Absolutely, absolutely. And and just to kind of segue a bit, um, clearly the representation of, of uh, Black professionals on the fundraising side and the, the, the funding side um, impact this conversation. So if you don't see people who look like you, if you don't have people who have similar experiences as your own, then it's a little bit harder to imagine yourself in that seat or imagine yourself with the level of um, agency power and influence that sometimes come with philanthropy as well. So um, I, I, I wanna put that out there as we're, we're exploring the issue of representation and, and the depths of what it means for this conversation. Now, um, where do you see opportunities for Black and other equity-minded professionals 
to advance racial justice in particular through this work. So, you know, we have the representation of black and, I, and I'll expand it to black and other people of color. Um, so there's representation, representation at its core, but also people who are equity minded. So people who want to engage in the work of racial justice. So where do you see some key opportunities um, to advance this work um, a, as a professional? Uh, Christy. Sure, and I want to acknowledge, uh, you know, the chat is lighting up um, and, and a point that's being made is, you know, what happens when you are the only of color in the room. Um, so that that also, you know, that also weighs in into this because there's been many instances when I'm not just representing black folks, I'm representing all <laughs> of color uh, folks in, in, in conversations, especially in um, spaces of quote unquote power, right? And I think to answer the question, it's in everything. There's always an opportunity to advance racial justice. It's in no matter what program, programmatic work that your organization funds or your giving circle is focused on. It's, um, you know, for me, uh, leading the work for the foundation in New Orleans, it, it was not only making sure that we were able to get resources to more organizations led by black leaders or, or people of color, but actually taking the time to do a racial equity analysis of our portfolio and pushing my team to say, our portfolio needs to look like the demographics of New Orleans. And, um, and making strides to do that over the years. I've been with the foundation for eight and a half years now. Um, at, at first it was just me <laughs> in New Orleans and now we have a team um, which is awesome because there's more brain power, there's more, uh, you know, folks to, to lead and guide this work, but collectively making that a priority of not just paying attention to the key program areas that the foundation supports, but who we are supporting in those program areas and then to do what. Um, how is that, how are we not just looking at, um, disparity, like understanding the needs of the community, but focusing on the assets and what's the opportunities there. Um, and so I would also, I wanna acknowledge my privilege in the fact that I, in my philanthropic experience, I have been fortunate enough to work for organizations where racial equity was a priority. So all, all the way from the start of my grant making, which was at the city of New Orleans, um, in the Economic Development Fund grant program to Louisiana Disaster Recovery Foundation post Katrina, um, and which became Foundation for Louisiana. And now with the W.K. Kellogg Foundation where our DNA is racial equity, racial healing, uh, community engagement and leadership development. I am really clear that my colleagues and other foundations do not live in this space. So it is also very important to build relationships with other funders and to, um, in, in funder collaboratives, like we have a, a funder collaborative here in New Orleans called the Greater New Orleans Funder, funder Network. That is a space where we can get together, we can discuss strategy, we can discuss you know, what's going on in the city, what's going on in the nonprofit landscape, and co-create strategy and investments that gives each other cover. I can go out first and I can say the things and a lot of my colleagues cannot. So when we are in partnership, we can leverage each other and it allows for other um, people of color and other foundations who, whose organizations don't necessarily have that same commitment to racial equity, um, they can still, do the work that they want to do, but it's leveraging other funders and in partnership. So I just want to point that out that not all Black folks in philanthropy are having the same experience. It is it is unique to each person and each team and each foundation and each region around around the country. But um, there is there is power in numbers, and when we can lean into um, associations like ABFI, which is the Association of Black Foundation Executives, you can find you know, your support, you can find your network, you can find your co-conspirators and, um, and, and partners in this work. 
So I'll just, I'll stop right there. Yes, thank you, Christy. And I'm so glad that you talk about the power of partnership and collaboration um, because that is one of the key ways that uh, throughout my career, I've seen community change through that level of partnership. And it has to be intentional. It has to uh, figuring out who can bring what to the table and who has influence in what space and being really strategic about that, I think is key to advancing um, those opportunities. Uh, Kimberly, what are your thoughts? I have a lot, so let me try to consolidate them. I, I'm gonna say off that I, I think one of the things that, that those of us who can impact racial equity work need to think about the end, Th begin our work. And a lot of times we need to look at strategy. What is it that we're trying to achieve? and then figure out the strategy to get there. But I also think it's important to add that everybody who does this work, regardless of their approach to doing the work, has a seat at the table, whatever that table looks like. And so that's important to, to say that those who shake the table, they have an important place in this conversation. Those who may be a little bit more traditional in their approach and wanna study what's happening, they have a place at the table as well, as well as those that just say, forget all of that, cause I'm just gonna create my own. And I think when I, I think about the past year, a little over a year now, since um, Ahmaud Arbery and um, George Floyd and, um, and Brianna, what we begin to look at is all of these racial equity funds that have popped up. And then I started asking the question, but where's the money going? Because these Black-led organizations are not getting it. So if you're not giving it to Black-led organizations, who's doing the work? Well, that's a different problem because we're going back to my statement in the first question. This is about assimilation. Because if we're not including the cultural, rele the cultural relevant pieces of this, then part of this conversation doesn't even matter. We're doing all of this for show. So one of the things that I really think we have to do is we have to honor the space and the various players that it takes to move all of this forward. It does take those of us who I am a table shaker. I admit that. But I am also the person who'll say, but let's go and create our own. I'm the one that says it's time for us to walk away. But I am the person that started off by just going and being a student of people and watching all of the players so that I knew when it was time for me to speak, I was going to be very targeted in my approach. And so I think that for all of us that are trying to advance racial justice work, it takes us to respect every last person, even when we don't agree every last person because we all are adding value it takes somebody to bring attention and sometimes those that are shaking tables and saying let's walk away they're the ones that are bringing attention to the table then there needs to be some level of change in conversation maybe people that want to negotiate well maybe those are the people that are students and that still do well in more traditional spaces and then there are those that say we need something new all together and go out and create everybody is important. And I think when we're talking about racial, um, advancing racial um, equity and advance, advancing racial justice, even within the community, we have to stop putting people higher, bringing other people down. Because for me, we all have a part. And if we didn't all have a part, we wouldn't be moving the needle as much as we are right now. This is a collective effort on the part of many. And my biggest thing is just be honest um, and be respectful of everybody that is choosing to step forward to advance the work because we all have a place in, in, in the work. Absolutely. And, and Mark, I, I see there's um, a few questions in the chat and we'll get to your questions, but I wanna uh, give Mark an opportunity to weigh in on this as well. I mean, I don't, I don't even know how to add to what Christy and, and Kimberly just did. Um, uh, so sometimes it's better just to shut up uh, you know, when, when the answer has already been given. But, but I, I will say this, and, and, and I'll turn the conversation around just a little bit and say that there, there are so many organizations in our community that are just doing the regular work, the everyday work to serve the people. And, you know, sometimes they don't have a, a specific racial equity initiative. They don't have a center for racial justice. They don't have a, a, a program. They're just out there doing the work. And we can't forget about those organizations. So when we're talking about funding, you know, the community, we're talking about funding the things that are really happening in the, to, to bring our people forward. We have to make sure that those organizations survive as well. Uh, so supporting the operations 
it's not always or should not always be taboo. Uh, it doesn't always have to be a specific program that's, that's supported. Sometimes the organization itself just needs help to survive and sustain the work. And so I just want to just add to the conversation that let's not forget you know, the, the, the one and two person operation in the community that's out there doing the work on the ground uh, let's make sure that those organizations are, are getting the support that they need so that they can survive so that they can continue the work as well. Can I just add, because I, I want to give an example of, of how some of this can work. Last year, I sat on a panel, it must have been June, it was right after George Floyd last year, and I just felt the heat rising on the panel because everything just seemed so glorious. And we were talking about the funding that was being distributed, we were talking about racial equity, and I said, but who's giving it to the black led organization because many of these organizations that are the one and two operation organizations as mark referred to that they've been around for a decade um they have the data all of these things so why aren't they getting funding and literally people were calling that organization looking for me the next day and someone said i felt like you were telling and it was a, a oil and gas family organization um, foundation and they asked for a list just tell us who give us the list of the organizations and immediately i went to heritage giving fund i went to dr francois booker drew i went to akila wallace we got that list we sent the list and without anything one of those organizations got a grant for twenty five thousand dollars simply because we spoke up and so it's important that we recognize when we have that moment that moment might not always feel like somebody's going to give somebody something or you're going to be it's going to be a tangible benefit but if that spotlight that mic that opportunity in a meeting is on you for you to provide anything factual and honest about what's not happening to change the landscape when everything else is glossy we've got to have those intentional conversations and sometimes step out a little differently to make that change that one that one comment that i made which is probably about two minutes long because i was hot but that one comment opened the door for this continual conversation with this foundation has opened the door for additional conversations with other foundations in this region as well. And so we have a responsibility when we're advancing or we're working to advance that when we get it, let's not, let's not shy away because sometimes we have to pull away from my, I'm not comfortable in sharing that information. How is this going to look for me? I am on a mission. We are all on a mission and we have to put all of that forward and we have that opportunity. We will miss that opportunity to advance the mission if we are not thinking a little differently and sharing what people need to know about the work that still needs to be done in our communities. Ooh, I want to jump in. <laughs> Tag me in. <laughs> um, so, I, you know, I think it's, it's, uh, it's not just in those external moments is also inside the organizations that we are serving in. Because when you, so I work for a national foundation, but I'm on a place-based team, which is a different thing. Who's on the ground is who's on the ground. National colleagues can, can work with the higher capacity organizations that can take on millions of dollars here it's very difficult for a very small nonprofit, you know, piggybacking on what Mark said, to get national foundation dollars. So over time, I've had, I was, I'm always was the, but why kid. So help me understand why. What do they need to do? What's, what do we, what, what is it going to take to get there? Do we need a fiscal sponsor? Do we need to do some capacity building? And so it's been funding strategies and sub strategies trying to stay aligned with with key foundation programming but understanding what else does the community need if we need to build the capacity of the nonprofit sector in new orleans let me just say i y'all y'all probably already know this post katrina we had all kind of national funders come down here and it sounds crazy because i'm one and all i kept hearing was we don't have nonprofit capacity. All right, well, give us some money, then we can build the capacity. I mean, like it's the chicken or egg thing, but you got to put some dollars here and not five, not, you know, I can't do nothing with $5. So how, how are we building the, strengthening the nonprofit sector while still advancing the work 
and seeing the change that we want to see in in the community. So it's a multi layered strategy, and it's not you can't just you have to think about it like that. And especially if you are a person of color inside a predominantly white organization, you have to be the voice to say, okay, yes. But these are the people that are on the ground. These are the, 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 the partners that we have to advance this work. So we have to think about how we actually get resources to them. And so it's a level of creative grant making that, uh, you know, you have to be constantly thinking about how am I going to, there's always another way to win, but how am I going to get these resources to the, the folks that need a, the most? And it doesn't always, it's not a straight line. It's, change doesn't happen in a grant cycle. And you have to be thinking about all of these things, advancing the strategies of the foundation, meeting the needs of the community and building the capacity of the partners that are, are delivering the hard work, the great work on the ground. So if I can, if I can just add this, because I wanna just tie what Christy did back into the first question. When you, when we, when you ask the question, why is representation important? Without somebody like Christy at the table, thinking about these things this way, having this kind, of, kind, this kind of conversation, bringing this to the Kellogg Foundation, you would not see the kind of investment that Kellogg is making in this community right now. And, and I can personally attest to you that it's, it is significant. Uh, and, and they are reaching out to you know, all types of organizations, the big and the small. But that doesn't happen without the representation of a Christy Slater. So, you know, I, I just wanted to tie that back into the first question because that is exactly why we need the representation. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And so if there are any foundations listening, if there are any large organizations listening and you're looking for talent, make sure you are intentional about seeking people of color to bring to the table to strengthen your work and to and and to that point there's a question actually in the chat i want to give us an opportunity to answer um one of the guests in the chat asked um I'm at an organization that has launched a robust DEI program, including both internal and external components. The internal component focuses on increasing the number of BIPOC staff and improving retention. That being said, do the panelists have any suggestions for what are good channels, websites, organizations to attract BIPOC candidates? Also, do you have any suggestions for building a sense of belonging and inclusion for BIPOC staff at, at a predominantly white organization? I'll, I'll take a stab. Oh, sorry, Kim, you wanna go ahead? Okay. Um, so I'll just say a couple of things. Um, organizations that are here in working in New Orleans, so um, Beloved does an equity audit. Um, I, I find this is really helpful because a lot of times organizations don't see the blind spots that they have, even when there's a dedication to building out a DEI initiative or wanting to be more inclusive. It's the, what, am I, what do I not see that, and it takes a, a third party to come in and help there. The Urban League of Louisiana has a full, um, equity program is a six month thing that an org they're taking an organization through that looks at everything from their hiring practices to their, um, all of their policies, their programs, the, you know, the, the structure of the staff. I mean, this is a very detailed, who's on the board. Um, uh, this is a very detailed process. I do think that looking at organizations like, um, the New Orleans Youth Alliance that is working with young people to prepare them uh, to become board members and, and re seek, actively seeking out organizations um, to find representation. I'm about to freak out on y'all because a lizard just, <laughs> just jumped off the block to my office. Oh my God, I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, you know, this is live, this is what happens, right? And so uh, there is a big old monster in my office in the moment, for the moment. 
but I would say in terms of building, um, building that kinship inside of the organization, something that we do at the Kellogg Foundation is that we have our own internal affinity groups. And so for, uh, for us, we have a group called Mazizi, and that's all of the Black um, staff members in the foundation are, are open to be a part of this, this, um, this organization is just a safe space for us to gather, for us to talk about whatever, life, strategy, dealing with stuff inside of the foundation. We have the same group for, same kind of group for Asian Pacific Islanders, for Latinx community. We have um, a, a space for white allies, for them to do their own learning and do their own homework. Um, and so just having that safe space, um, you know, it builds, kinship, it strengthens relationships, and it helps to drive um, strategy inside the organization. So that's just a few few examples of, um, you know, useful tools and partners in the work. And I'll just add, before shifting into nonprofit work, I did a lot of DEI work. We didn't call it DEI then, but I did a lot of DEI work, especially in the government um, arena. So these are the things, there needs to be an external audit conducted on all of your recruitment and hiring practices. There should be a uh, survey of all, I don't care if it's a small organization or a large organization, there needs to be some sort of an anonymous survey that employees can fill out and really share their information. Typically when you tie it to an email address and send it to them, they're not going to do it. So you need to find another way for them to be able to submit that. Um, shift from a lot of organizations, shift to on-demand um, DEI training, knock that out. It needs to be live when it's safe again or do synchronous, so live online um, because there needs to be engagement and conversation, not people just clicking to get through a half hour session um, on an on-demand training. Um, and then uh, to Christy's point about creating an internal, some sort of an internal committee or internal groups, that is always helpful. And that there's a process and an understanding that that information when needed goes back to the leadership. But this is the most important thing for me as it relates to DEI initiatives. Let the DEI coordinator, VP, manager, whatever the title director, let them do their job. If they have got to always go back to upper leadership for permission to do DEI work, you have not truly hired a DEI professional to take your organization to the next level. And to me, that is where most of our challenges are coming from in the DEI space, that DEI professionals are hired, but they're hired for appearance perspectives only, but they still need a lot of permission before they can actually move to push the organization forward. So those are some of the things that came to mind as I, as I was thinking about the question. Yeah, I'll just, I'll only add two things. Uh, and, and my, my answers are no, nowhere near as eloquent as usual as my, uh, my, my, my co-panelists, but I would say HBCUs. There's so much talent. There's so much, there's so many resources at HBCUs where you can find the people you are looking for to do the jobs and to do them well. So HBCUs. The second thing I would say, just in terms of the organizational culture, in terms of retaining people, just treat people right. You know, uh, you know, I, I don't, I don't question the need for DEI professionals in these spaces. I understand it, but wouldn't it be great if you could better you utilize those resources for something else in your company to help you make money? Why, you know, if we, if pay equity was there, if you don't tolerate the foolishness in your workspaces, if you just do the basic things to treat everybody right, yeah, I think. We would just, it would just be a lot easier for you as an employer, and it would be a lot easier for the employees. Uh, you know, we, we, we make a complicated thing out of something that could be very easy by just simply treating people right. Uh, and, and I think those, those kinds of cultural things, the things that we, that, you know, all organizations need to just get to that point where you don't need a DEI officer because everybody who comes into your organization knows that any employee, whoever, whoever they are and whatever they are, uh, will be treated the same way as anybody else in the organization. It sounds simple. I know it's not as easy as what I'm making it out to be, but it ought to be. I'll just add 30 seconds. Mark, it is as easy as you're saying. It's whether or not people want to do it. So that's number one. 
but I'll just add on recruitment, HBCUs and MSIs and minority serving institutions, reach out to ethnic giving circles, reach out to foundations that have, that have those relationships um, with, with organizations of color, period because it's not just about one group we're talking about really just expanding the workspace, but there has to be an intentional list of places that you're going to use to recruit, not just your website, not just a foundation's website, but you place it places, then you intentionally push it places as well. If you want to get a, a nice pool of people to consider, then you have to cast your net wide to be able to get a myriad of people to be able to choose from. Absolutely. And I'll add to that, you know, um, I, I think one thing that sticks with me is investing in the cultivation of talent. Um, you know, Mark, I really appreciate that you mentioned HBCUs. Um, here at SOPA, we recently launched a minority serving institution scholarship for students who are interested in graduate study. Um, who graduated from any of the minority serving institutions. So that includes HBCUs, Hispanic serving, um, indigenous schools. So all, all of those institutions, um, I think having an investment in being really intentional and in cultivating that talent pipeline. And it, it doesn't happen overnight. You know, Mark, you mentioned um, the, I think it was the Kresge HBCU initiative that you were talking about. And there was a training component to that where they invested resources in, in training and skill development for this next cultivation or next generation of black philanthropy professionals and 10 plus 15, well, I'm, I don't want to tell how old you are, Mark, but years after the initiative. It's, 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 not, it's okay, 51. <laughs> So years after that initiative, I'd be really interested to see where everyone who came through that cohort of training, where they are now, where they've been, what's the impact of their careers across the landscape of HBCUs, which was the imp intended impact area. So yeah. where have they had an impact? Yeah, um, you know, so there, there's actually some, some information on that now. Uh, uh, I think about three quarters of us are still in the fundraising profession. Uh, and about half of the ones who are still in, in this business have reached the level of vice president or higher in whatever organization they're in. So it definitely uh, had an impact on, on the industry. Definitely, thank you. We have another question here in the chat. Um, what if we don't have the, and this is, I think this focuses more on individual donor, or donors. What if we don't have the financial uh, resources to write the big check but have in-kind skills and services that can equate and build the capacity of our Black organizations and institutions. Where do we fit at the table? You fit at the table. You are needed at the table. What The one thing that we have to make sure when we have an in-kind service or products, whatever the offering is, make sure the organization needs it. We have a habit of giving organizations things that they don't need, not that they, things that they want, but things that they need. If they need it and you have that conversation with the organization and they agree to it, but we have many organizations that will accept things because they are afraid to say no. So make sure that you are, you know, you're know, you doing your due diligence and being upfront and respectful of that organization too. You want to give, you have a talent and they probably need it, but make sure it's the right season for it. Make sure they can receive it and make sure the timing is right. Because if not, you're giving something to an organization that may not be used at that time. They may not have the right people in place. So I just always say, ask the organization first. And sometimes organizations don't know what they need. Just have that conversation with them, help them to understand it and let them be the ones to say yes or no, or maybe not at this time, can we defer it to another time? The other part that I would add to that is, agreed 100% with, with Kimberly say that this is, um, it's, it's needed and also make sure it's the right fit. And I would take it a step further and um, help to monetize that for the organization. Like what is this, what value does this bring? Because they can then use that as they're approaching foundations to show both um, other funder dollars that they've received and in-kind services that um, helps with them with, helps with public support 
meeting different IRS regulations in terms of how much a foundation can give to an organization. So it's not just what you are providing, but help them to understand the actual value of that beyond, uh, beyond the service. It has a ripple effect. Talking to myself, thank you. <laughs> So we have another question, and I, I think this um, points more to the sustainability um, and long-lasting impact of the DEI work that we've been seeing. So the question is, do you think that the heavy focus on DEI that we've seen since the, mur the murder of Ger George Floyd will continue, or do you feel as, as though it's a trend that we'll have to fight to keep the momentum going? So I'm asked this question quite a bit. Uh, particularly because at Dillard University, we've been beneficiaries of uh, a good amount of this type of money. Uh, and what I do is, uh, so I'll flip the conversation. We've been talking about the funders for a long time. Let's talk about the fundraisers. Uh, I think the fundraisers have a responsibility in this regard. Uh, it, yes, it would be great to see, uh, you know, a lot of things happen in this country over time. You know, so I was in New Orleans for Hurricane Katrina. Uh, and for several years after Hurricane Katrina, uh, we received money because of that. Well, after, you know, there was a thing that we call Katrina fatigue after a number of years. That can keep going. But what has to happen is the people who are beneficiaries of this type of funding have a responsibility to continue those relationships. So that, and, and also to make sure you're doing what the money, what the funders expect you to do with the money. So that's called donor stewardship. Uh, if, you, if you have those things in place, yes, this can sustain over a period of time. But if you just take the money uh, and you do whatever you do with it and you lose those relationships and that happens over you know, the scale of, of philanthropic or, or, or nonprofit organizations, then yeah, we're gonna see that this is kind of a thing that's gonna fade until, it's gonna fade until the next thing happens in this country and you know, people are not onto something else. So uh, I think that, it, it, yes, it would, be, it would be great to see Mackenzie Scott continue to do that kind of level of funding for all of those organizations. Uh, but we have a responsibility as the people who are recipients, one, to, to sustain the relationships, two, to make sure that we are uh, honoring the donor's wishes in terms of how we steward those dollars, because that would be very, very important uh, in terms of how you build the trust with them going forward. What I would add, if I could jump in, is at the national level, we're seeing corporate foundations um, holding each other accountable and continuing, um, continuing to say, okay, you put out that press release, you had a lot to say, what was, you know, now what's up? What you gonna do? Um, so there's a Southern Communities Initiative that was started by uh, Robert Smith and um, it's bringing you know, larger corporate um, partners to invest in Southern regions. So we're seeing you know, national foundations that have been doing this work are you know, constantly tapping their colleagues um, and in order to keep the momentum going. But I wanna also say to a point that Mark made, especially about Katrina, we had to shift the narrative after Katrina from you know, this is tugging at folks' heartstrings to no, this is a smart investment play. You know, um, we did a report in 2018 called the Business Case for Racial Equity for New Orleans and, and the state of Louisiana. And basically it was highlighting um, that by 2050, the state of Louisiana is gonna be majority minority. So if you are not making it intentional shifts in your practice in order to have be more inclusive in education and workforce and healthcare um, that includes philanthropy then not only are you uh, you're going to be behind the curve you're going to miss out on the potential gains and so you're capping the economic potential of the state um, so you're not getting any richer right so it's 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 also taking a look at what's coming and how are we preparing for it? So that that's a different conversation than, um, you know, can we all just get along, kumbaya, let's do the right thing. This is, no, this is a business decision. This is a smart investment to make. 
And so I think that's how the momentum keeps going by not just what Mark is saying about being good stewards of, of the resources, but it's also like, no, this is a smart investment. You are going to see a return in terms of impact in the community. These are the, this is, this is where we need to be investing our time, talent, and treasure. And the last thing that I will add to that is from the fundraisers perspective and the organizations that are seeking the funding. And it's also your responsibility to be honest about the narrative. Um, and not to sensationalize things that funders may want to see that are not no, that are no longer true or not true at all about the communities that you serve. We have to be good stewards of the story as well. And we can't chase dollars and go after dollars and allow people to talk about our communities and our children especially in ways that do not match what truly happens. It goes back to what I said in the beginning about culture and what's relevant about our culture. So our fundraisers have a responsibility not to sensationalize trauma and tragedy, when, especially when it doesn't reflect the needs of the community um, and the respect of the people, the places and the things that we're advocating for. Thank you, thank you. So I started this conversation with a full glass of water. Um, <laughs> y'all have uh, brought me to a place. So thank you for that. And, and really quickly, um, we have a few minutes left. The most important advice that you would give audience members who are interested in building a career in this space to have this impact. Speed round, Mark. <laughs> so I wanna say first, align your professional skills with your personal passion. Uh, you know, this, this work that we do in philanthropy is not just about making some money. And you will not be successful in this if you, if you don't feel the work that you're doing. Uh, I've, I, I, I don't have enough time to give you my own personal uh, testimony about this, but I have one. Uh, and so I have been in a space where I worked at a place where, you know, my, you know, it, it was good, it was a good job, uh, but, you know, I wasn't doing the kind of work that was passionate for me. Uh, and then had an opportunity to come to a place where I was doing the work that, was, that meant a lot to me. So align your passion with your professional skills uh, would be the first thing that I tell you. And then I will also say, consider credentialing. Uh, this business and philanthropy uh, has really evolved. You know, it, it became a profession probably in the late 60s and the 70s, uh, but it has really evolved into an intricate uh, you know, this is not just somebody coming off the street doing this work anymore. I mean, this is this, this is a business. Uh, and now there are degree programs. Uh, you know, uh, I have a, a master's degree in philanthropy and development. Uh, you know, I have a certification uh, that's called CFRE. It's the Certification of, of, of uh, cert Certified Fundraising Executive. Uh, so consider credentialing if you want to do this as a, uh, as a career, because it's, uh, uh, this really is an important industry. Uh, it needs to be viewed and seen as an important industry. Uh, and what we do uh, with this industry is not just impacting today, but impacting our futures. I'll just say, don't overstate what you can do. Don't underestimate what you can do. Um, and I think it's also important um, to remember that you are focused on a career, if that's your, if that's your tra trajectory and that's a direction but this career that you're choosing impacts people's lives. And so there's a certain level of responsibility and there's a certain level of honesty and integrity that needs to accompany your pursuit and, and working within the sector. So honesty, integrity, um, and just remember that there are people and lives at the end of the work. And you have to keep that in mind as you're, as you're moving forward. Amen. Um, you know, the community holds me to a higher standard than the foundation ever could. Um, and that's because I'm here working amongst my community. I grew up in New Orleans. I'm raising my family here. Folks love to stop me when I'm yelling at my children in Costco. They hold me to a higher level than anybody else. Um, but what I would say is network, build relationships. Um, there is far more entries into philanthropy now than there was when I started. Um, and actually when I became a grant maker, it's, it's been 17 years ago now, that I, you know, I didn't know anything about philanthropy. I didn't know that it was a field to go into. All I knew was that that um, foundations 
put their names on buildings at universities and they funded PBS programs. That's about it. And so, um, you know, at this point, especially in New Orleans, there's, there's far more opportunities than existed um, pre-Katrina. And I would also say um, that what, what has really been exciting is that it's not just folks going into quote unquote traditional philanthropy, like going to work for a specific foundation, it's folks creating their own. And whether that is a giving circle that grows into a larger entity, or if it becomes um, an affinity group or a philanthropic support organization, there's space to create and carve your own path. So I think it's, it's you know, paying attention to the landscape, talking to folks like everybody that's on this panel, um, seeing what opportunities are there. And if you don't find one you like, create your own. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you so much. Um, I just, I can't express enough how grateful I am for the work that you all have done in your careers, um, you know, as, as we think about this, you all see why I love philanthropy so much, why I love these conversations so much. So thank you um, to our panelists and to our guests, the people in the chat. Um, this, this has truly been a rich and fruitful conversation. And I hope that everybody who's a part of this was just as informed and inspired as I have been. So thank you for that. Um, I'll also say I'd love for us to stay connected. So uh, we have our contact information uh, pulling up here. So let's really stay connected. These are our, our partners who've supported uh, through the, the panelists here, Mark, again, from Diller University Center for Racial Justice. Uh, we have Christy from the WK Kellogg Foundation and Kimberly from the Heritage Giving Fund. Um, and I believe in the next slide, we have our contact information uh, where you can reach me. Um, you can also stay connected with Tulane um, School of Professional Advancement and the Public Administration Program as well. So let's keep the conversation going. I encourage you all to reach out and stay connected with us. And apologies for my cat in the background who apparently has some things to say. Uh, but uh, again, thank you all. And you have a wonderful evening and continue to stay encouraged. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thanks.